So, uh, apparently we now live in a post-truth world. Now, um, don't worry, I don't think that means the truth stopped being true. But what it does mean is that no one really knows who or what to believe anymore. Um, now, modern science tells us that the world is a very complex place. But it's much easier and more attractive to believe oversimplified statements. Especially when scientists talk in impenetrable language and use the language of uncertainty. But many of the decisions that we make as individuals and as a society involve science. Dietary decisions, environmental concerns, the list goes on and on. So a scientifically aware society has the potential to be healthier and better informed when making democratic decisions, which is why it's really important to communicate science in a way that speaks to as many people as possible without oversimplification. Now, I'm going to show you that songs are a uniquely effective way of doing this because of their ability to do five things. So firstly, they can engage audiences. They can familiarize the complicated language of science. They can convey meaningful understanding, enhance memory and recall, and finally, they can bridge the perceived gap between the arts and the sciences. So let's start with engagement. Now, whether I'm in my role as a teacher or an entertainer, the first thing I need to do is engage my audience, which means getting them to participate or have some kind of emotional involvement with what I'm saying. So I'm going to give you, this is the Wikipedia definition of DNA. Now, how many of you feel like you want to participate in that? Probably not many. And I'm guessing most people, when they see this, their only emotion is mild terror. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put much the same information into a calypso for you. And uh, well, let's see how that works. Within every little cell that's in all of us Is a tiny little thing called a nucleus But it's the stuff inside that really caused the fuss It's the stuff that tells the bodies how to grow into us It's a very long and complicated molecule But for something so small it's very influential It will make you grow big and strong and tall Or if it's like mine it makes you hairy and small It's DNA DNA, three little letters with a lot to say. Deoxyribonucleic acid, hey, that's DNA. It come in little packets called chromosome. You get half from your daddy and half from your mom. It's a double helix ladder with a coat made from paired nucleic acids, and it's very long. Well, the adenine pairs with the thymine. The guanine pairs with the cytosine And when you got enough pairs You got a gene Which will tell a cell How to make a protein It's DNA DNA Three little letters with a lot to say A deoxyribonucleic acid Hey, that's DNA Oh, 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 oh. Every time a cell divide and make a replication Every now and then there is a mutation And a mutation may cause an innovation And that might make a situation Like a baby being born with 11 toes Or a blood disease or a massive nose Don't make babies with your cousin Cause you should know It multiplies the chances that the defects show It's DNA, DNA Three little letters with a lot to say Deoxyribonucleic acid Hey, that's DNA, DNA, oh, DNA. It could make you crazy, it could make you gay. It could make your hair fall all away. It could make it blonde, brown, blue, or gray. DNA, oh, DNA. It could make you want to fight or want to pray. It could make you drop down dead today. Oh, that's DNA, oh, oh, oh. Acid. That's DNA. So, I'm, 
I'm guessing you wouldn't have applauded if I'd just read the, uh, the Wikipedia definition. No, but you did applaud, and that's engagement. You had a positive emotional response, partly because I made you laugh, um, but also because music directly affects our emotions, which is why it has such wide appeal. Now, even small children who don't get the jokes or understand the science love that song. Um, I was backstage at a science festival one time, and a fellow science communicator um, and very proud father showed me a video of his three-year-old daughter singing the whole song from start to finish. So songs can be engaging enough to get three-year-olds to say deoxyribonucleic acid, which is both very impressive and very adorable. And it brings us on to our second point. That three-year-old girl was familiarized with the complicated language of genetics in a really non-threatening way. Now, scientific language can be a massive barrier to engagement. For scientists, it's very useful. It's accurate, it's concise. For the rest of us, it's just confusing. Um, now, even though she didn't understand any of the words, this young girl is going to come across them in school one day, and she'll presumably be a lot more comfortable than her friends who didn't have biochemistry in their nursery rhymes. <laughs> so let's move on to conveying understanding. Now, songs are actually really good at this, partly because you can lay the information out as you would in a textbook. But the difference is, in a song, you have to be much more economical with your language. And you actually repeat the main point over and over again in the chorus, which makes the ex explanation incredibly clear. Now, I've found that writing lyrics is even better for developing understanding of science, which is why, as a teacher, I'll get my students to write their own science songs. Uh, now, teachers might say, well, that takes up too much extra time. But actually, when teachers get students to embed understanding, they do it by getting students to explain topics in their own words. When you write a song, you do that multiple times for every single line to find the one that rhymes and scans perfectly. Now, students often find these topics kind of te uh, these tasks kind of tedious. Um, it feels like jumping through hoops for no reason. But when you've got a song, not only do you have a bit of music to brighten up the atmosphere, you also get a useful product. They get their own catchy revision song that they have ownership over. And it turns out it's not just me and my students that can learn from uh, songwriting. Even world experts can learn from the songwriting process. I recently uh, wrote songs with five of Oxford University's leading academics, and this is us presenting them live on the streets of Oxford to the public. Now, when they went through the songwriting process, they were forced to clarify and refine their explanations, so much so that some of them actually gained new insights into their research by doing so. So let's move on to enhancing memory and recall. Melody, rhythm, repetition and rhyme all improve the encoding and retrieval of information, which is why advertisers use jingles and why non-literate cultures have, for thousands of years, used songs to pass knowledge from one generation to the next. And all of these things, engagement, language learning, memory and understanding, have direct links to education. So why not have songs that encode the learning of the entire curriculum? Songs that teachers can use in their lessons and that students can listen to on headphones in their own time. So this is one of the things I do, and I call them Psytunes. So what I'm going to do is I am going to teach you about Newton's three laws of motion now. And uh, the words will be on the screen, so if you want to sing along, please do. A force is just a push or pull, there's many types we're knowing. A force can change an object, shape its speed, or where it's going. You found three laws that will describe this completely. That's Newton 1, and that's Newton 2, and of course, that's Newton 3. Newton 1 describes how any object might behave when all its forces balance out in each and every way. 
Mid silence staying still or moving at a steady rate in the same direction till the force is on a change. It means that if I threw a ball in space, it'd fly off endlessly. That one's known as new one. Here comes two and three. New two describe how motion changes with a force. We know instinctively it changes speed and changes course. Bigger objects need a bigger push to make them move. If the force is double, acceleration doubles too. RF equals MA, you could say mathematically. That one's known as Newton 2. Here comes Newton 3. Newton 3 describes the fact the forces come in twos. When you push upon a thing, it pushes back on you. Always directly opposite and always the same size. It's the reason that momentum is conserved when things collide. Means I'm pulling up the earth as much as it pulls down on me. That one's known as Newton's third or sometimes Newton's three. So if all your forces balance, you'll maintain velocity. Acceleration and force applied increase proportionally. For every force, an equal one will act opposingly. That's Newton 1 and that's Newton 2, and of course, that's Newton 3. Okay, let's move on to bridging the, and I'm going to put this in inverted commas, the gap between the arts and the sciences. Now, the perceived gap between the arts and sciences prevents many people identifying with scientific thinking. And identity is really important, particularly to teenagers who are choosing their identities in life and their academic paths. Now, for too long, science has been seen as the cold, impersonal opposite to the creative and caring arts. Now, that's a false dichotomy. You don't have to be one or the other, and there are a lot of overlaps. Can you imagine if Einstein's violin teacher had said, you know what, Albert, I think you need to leave that science so we can nurture your creative brain. He never would have used that creative brain to discover new physics, because dis discovery is in part a creative process. Now, also, if you're someone who cares about the world's problems, Science is a great way to solve many of them. So, there you go. Now, songs can speak to the people who are put off by this myth and help them put their prejudices aside for long enough to see the human side of science. In 2014, I did a project with the Wellcome Collection in London, working along some, alongside some sexual behavior researchers and these young people here. And what we wanted to do was get them to do a, a little research project and then write songs about the process and about what they found. The problem is, young people don't read the small print, and they, they all thought they'd come just for a songwriting uh, workshop. So when I told them that they'd be doing science, they were a bit disappointed. Um, nearly all of them had given up science in school. In fact, one of them had given up on school completely, so they were like, this is going to be boring. But they, because of the songwriting, they went with it. And in the end, they actually conducted a survey of over 400 members of the public, and they wrote a dozen songs about the science. But what was best for me was that the discussions they'd had with the researchers were so interesting and different from the researchers that it actually inspired their future research studies. In this way, the young people actually made a contribution to science. And this really brings home the way that songs can re-engage the disengaged and help them see science as relevant. So by brightening classrooms, developing public understanding, re-engaging the disengaged, and connecting researchers with the public, songs not only can spread awareness of science, but can help researchers be more aware of the needs of society. So songs can really democratize knowledge and help the complex ideas of science be less intimidating next to the oversimplified statements of the post-truth world. And I'd like to finish with a song now about one of the most complex bits of physics there is, the Higgs boson. And I wrote this song when I was asked to play the first ever comedy night at the Large Hadron Collider where it was discovered. 
And I wanted to make the song both understandable for the public that were invited, but also give the scientists something to think about. So the Higgs boson was originally predicted to solve problem, uh, problems in the fundamental uh, equations of physics because they were what physicists called asymmetrical. Now, in a very simple term, that means the equations weren't very pretty. <laughs> and no one knows why, but the prettier and the more beautiful and elegant the equations, the better they seem to fit with reality. Now, for me, this means that theoretical physics is basically based on a subjective idea of beauty. <laughs> so, theoretical physicists are actually some of the best artists I've come across. Oops. Now the superstitious fear, a broken mirror. While scientists choose rationality, and yet the one thing that a physicist can simply not abide is when nature shows a broken symmetry. So if you've ever tried to weigh a ray of sunlight, you'll know that it's a very tricky thing to try. For the photons in the ray of light are massless, unlike the particles with mass that go to make up you or I. So it seems the standard model's asymmetrical. For the bosons should all have mass the same. And so there needs to be a field that will only be revealed by its boson, and the Higgs will be its name. They're looking for the boson given mass to matter. The model only holds if it exists. The way they're finding is by hadron colliding. It's a hell of a way to go hunting for a Higgs. Now when they'd finished all their calculations, the only way to solve the mystery was to accelerate some protons and watch as they collide in the biggest machine that ever was built in all of history. It needed 27 kilometers of tunnels, 100 meters neath some alpine hills. It took 111 nations working in cahoots because it's the only way they'd ever pay the bills. They're looking for the boson given mass to matter. The model only holds if it exists. The way they're findings by Hadron colliding, it's a hell of a way to go hunting for a Higgs. Now hunting for a Higgs amongst the debris of collision is like looking for a needle in a haystack made of needles when the needle that you're looking for is an invisible sort of needle that very quickly changes into other types of needle. So you need a big computer to sort through all the needles and do the necessary number crunching needed to determine if a Higgs-like needle needed to be there. And the simile's been taken much too far. They're looking for the bows on given mass to matter. The model only holds if it exists. The findings by Hadron colliding It's a hell of a way to go hunting for a Higgs Yes, it's a hell of a way to go hunting for anything at all But especially a Higgs